Hey, y'all. So uh, it is Saturday, October 7th. We woke up this morning to news that militants from Gaza, from the Gaza Strip, had launched a, a full-scale assault uh, on targets across southern Israel, fired thousands of rockets uh, into the rest of Israel as far north uh, as Tel Aviv. So I'm joined by Helen Zhang. Helen, you were you were posted in Israel during your time uh, in the yeah. Australian Foreign Service. Uh, we we don't know a lot about what's happening. I mean, the casualty counts keep rising every minute. But just wondering, as far as we know, what are the facts on the ground at the moment? Well, I mean, I think we've seen that this is something that uh, is probably once in a generation. I don't think we've seen something like this since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Right. Uh, on the ground, I mean, it's the scenes of devastation uh, in civilian areas. You know, Hamas has launched an air, land and water strike. So they came up, you know, through paragliders landing in Israel um, and came over the border. Um, and this is something that I think military pundits have been kind of speculating and warging for years. Um, but they've broken through walls and fences, fighting across Israeli border towns, and I think fired at least 5,000 rockets, which is more than those fired during the 15-day war back in uh, 2021. Yeah. Um, so look, it's a scenes of devastation, right? There's um, at least 70 Israelis killed so far and over 1,000 wounded at the time of recording, which is 11 a.m. Eastern time here in um, Washington, D.C. Um, Dozens of Israeli soldiers, commanders, and civilians also taken hostage and brought yeah. back to Gaza, which is, you know, nothing like I've I've seen in my time. Um, and of course, Netanyahu has declared a state of war and launched air attacks against uh, Gaza. And so, yeah. at the time, it was you know, two hundred killed and over a thousand injured, which is just horrific. Right in in Gaza, two hundred yeah. killed and and over a thousand injured. We're hearing reports of around seventy Israelis killed, civilians and soldiers alike, and, and what we're seeing from open source intelligence on Twitter and across the internet is really horrific. I mean, civilians in towns like Sterot, which to tell you, Helen, yeah, I mean, I've spent, a lot of, I I've, I've spent a lot of time there as well. I have family mm -hmm. that live in these border regions. Um, civilians with their throats slit and, and lying dead in the streets. Um, and, you know, you talk about the war game um, the war gaming that's been done. Mm. Part of me thinks that this, let's talk, I mean, I want to talk about the intelligence failure here a, a bit. Um, part of me yeah. thinks this is sort of a failure of imagination that for years, Israelis had contended with rocket barrages from Gaza. There have even been instances where Gazan militants will dig tunnels underneath the walls and the fences that divide Gaza from Israel. But mm -hmm. this is just unprecedented. I mean, what went wrong here? Well, <laughs> I mean, sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but like this is just so, uh, so far from a departure, we're just so far departed from kind of like what the usual uh, tit for fat tack is between Israel right. and Gaza, right? So it's sort of unimaginable that this actually happened. Um, well, look, I think if we need to kind of go back to the Yom Kippur War, right, which is which is iconic because it today, I think, is uh, the attacks happened uh, exactly 50 years and one day after the Yom Kippur exactly. War, yeah. which is when last time, you know, Israel was attacked by uh, uh, Arab states um, in 1973. And it was, a, it was a spectacular failure of Israeli intelligence back then, right, in terms of taking things for granted and also assuming that the status quo would hold. Right. And you see that an analogy here today where we've had the Arab states um, seeking rapprochement with uh, Israel and, you know, warming ties between Israel and the Arab states. Um, and I think a stalemate and effectively a loss of voice for the Palestinians in that entire two piece, uh, sorry, two state peace process. Um, so it's it's it's. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think that this was kind of the Palestinians and the Hamas certainly uh, is sort of, you know, Hail Mary in terms of trying to claw back um, what they're trying to control the narrative and kind of bring the narrative back to where they are. And um, it seems like the Israeli intelligence has either been, um, I don't want to make speculations here, but I think from, it's, it seems like a pretty spectacular failure on their part to have yeah. even um, not anticipated this or to not have responded quickly to this. Um, well, there have, been, so, there have been plenty of distractions, right? I mean, this yeah. has been among the most tumultuous periods of domestic 
Israeli political history that I can recount. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I think what I find so interesting here is the man in charge of Israel right now, who's been in charge of Israel for, you know, what is it, 17 years or so on and, on and off, yeah. on and mm -hmm. off since 1999, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, or 1997, his MO, the reason when he turns to voters, he says, vote for me because I am the protector of Israel. Yeah. Is that invincibility, that, that aura of invincibility, is that pierced now? No, I mean, I actually think that it's going to strengthen his narrative, right? The mm. whole thing that he was banging on about during the Iran uh, nuclear deal was that he sort of fortified the country of like, it's us against them, right? It's everyone against us, and I'm the only one who can protect Israel. And so I think he's going to point to this and say, hey, this is what happened when I was out of office, right? Mm. You guys had uh, these, you know, putzes um, running uh, the country, and look where that got us today. So I actually think that this is going to strengthen his hand uh, and, and bolster a lot of uh, support and people who are on the right wing to support Netanyahu to come down even harder yeah. on the Palestinians and uh, the future of the two-state solution. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the debate during the course of the political turmoil we saw was uh, when, when reservist soldiers in the IDF yeah. were taking leave and refusing uh, to sign up for military service. Uh, the question was whether uh, that would damage Israel's ability to defend itself. And I think now we've seen that. I think the question here, at least from a political, domestic political sense, is who has the upper hand to say, um, you know, will, will, the, will the right be able to say this is the left's fault? These are the reservists' fault for not signing up for duty? Or will the reservists and you know, the left of Israeli politics be able to say, this is what the Netanyahu government has wrought. I mean, I, I'm not sure I agree with your assessment here. I, I think this could be the end of Bibi's political coalition. Yeah, um, I mean, we'll see, right? I mean, the country yeah. is probably more fractured than we've ever seen it in many ways, right? With the sort of judicial reforms and the issues that were bubbling up to the surface over the last two or three years. So yeah. this is kind of being like the, the the spilling over point, right? But domestically for Israel and then also for uh, for folks in Gaza. I mean, it's been, let's talk about, you know, the people who are living in Gaza and the horrific conditions, humanitarian right. situation there has been the worst that it's been for a long time. So I think... What we're looking at here in terms of next steps is we have two things, right? Is the West Bank uh, and uh, others in the West Bank going to join and, in? And Lebanon right? and Hezbollah and, and Lebanon. Yeah, and Hezbollah and sort of this like multi-front war, which is always something that the uh, my military contacts certainly were always um, warning about, right? This is the worst case scenario, like the Gaza war opening up the, a front in the south, a front in the east, and right. then a front in the north. Well, we, um, we've heard yeah, for a long time is... that an intifada, a Palestinian uprising in the West Bank w was likely because of yeah. the... I guess the excesses of the Israeli coalition. Uh, we didn't expect this though. I mean, this is just shocking. This is beyond the pale uh, yeah. as, as an intelligence failure, as a military failure, as a failure of imagination for the Israeli government. Yeah, I, I know. I, absolutely. Absolutely. I think they were so kind of internally navel gazing uh, to resolve. I mean, it's all politicking, right? The last kind of year for Netanyahu has been sort of trying to consolidate um, his control over the Knesset. Right. Uh, and I, I don't know if this is a very simplistic way of looking at it, but when you're doing that, you kind of ignore, um, you tend to ignore the other things that are going on in the periphery. Yeah. Um, and I think this is this is what's happened. We've got so much reflecting to do on this. And, and mind we you, do. it's, this is it's 11 a.m. <laughs> yeah, it's 11 yeah. a.m. This started local time, I think, around midnight for us. We were both asleep by the time the news yeah. reports came in and mm -hmm. uh, it was the first thing we saw when we when we woke up. But if you had to take an initial stab at the timing here, beyond yeah. Israel's domestic political situation, potentially the weakness that Hamas saw there, yeah. What's going on in the in the region that could explain yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are, these are all great questions, Ethan. I mean, firstly, I think for, for the Palestinians, or for certainly for Hamas and Gaza, as I mentioned to Ethan, what's happening there is that they're coming to a sort of boiling point, right? They've yeah. reached a stage where they feel very disenfranchised in the two-state solution. And that is because in the region, we've seen Israel normalize ties with uh, other Middle Eastern countries, yeah. right? So we've always, UAE, they've always had... Uh, 
That's right. I mean, they've had ties with uh, Egypt and Jordan for years. And then in last uh, four, five years or three to five years, they've had normalization with Morocco, as you say. And right. Where else? Uh, UAE. UAE, Bahrain, like recently Bahrain. South Sudan. Yeah. Right. And then now we're looking at potentially Saudi Arabia, which is like a de facto sort of, you know, Gulf state leader. Um, and that would have been a huge deal because, of course, there's a lot of support for Hamas within Saudi Arabia. Um, elements of support. Well, for at us. least at least support for the Palestinian cause. Absolutely, absolutely, right. yeah. And I think if you, um, you know, regardless of whatever the kind of economic and military intelligence arguments are there, I think politically it sends a very strong signal to the Palestinians or certainly the Gazans that uh, Hamas, sorry, that uh, it, it's not um, it's not an, a priority for them anymore, right? Mm. So I think that in terms of the regional shifting of uh, ties and positioning for the Palestinians, they were feeling like really um, at a loss as to what yeah. to do next. And it wasn't looking like a favorable part for them. Uh, and then of course, Iran, like, hey, yeah. let's not forget about Iran, right? I think we saw Khamenei tweeted out, you know, this is the death of, this is the end of the Zionist regime um, earlier this morning. Um, and, you know, for, for many, for years, uh, Israeli intelligence uh, has been warning about Iranian support or funding for militants in, uh, in, Gaza, in Gaza. So yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, regional dynamics happening here. And that was, you know, my file when I was at the uh, embassy in, in Israel. So there's always uh, proxies, there's always um, broader things happening in the background, and it's never just as simple as a, a two-state solution in the actual, Absolutely. sorry, two-state. Pardon, yeah. uh, at the table at the two state solution I, I think this i think what we're seeing is a war between iran and israel i mean i, I think iran saw the possibility of absolutely israeli saudi normalization they, they tried to preempt this earlier this year i mean you were actually on the show uh when this happened the the saudi iran normalization deal you yeah. know they they worked to to push for a ceasefire in yemen doing all of these things to keep the Saudis away from the Israelis. And yet over the past month, we've heard report after report that the U.S. is intervening, signing defense pacts with the Saudis, uh, pushing to give them uh, nuclear weapon, nu nuclear technology rather. Mm -hmm. And so I think Iran got to the point where they said the only way to prevent this is by provoking Israel in the most shocking way possible. Um, yeah. And I, I think what they're trying to do is get Israel to respond um, in kind. And I mean, what do you what do you think? How will Israel respond? To oh, this I mean, attack? Israel is going to come down very hard on this situation, right? I think Netanyahu yeah. has already come out and said that this is uh, uh, that they are at war, war and that this is their, they're going to. Well, he's promised that um, they're going to exact a huge price, right? So. I think, look, what we've seen in the past in these sort of uh, the dynamics between Israel and Gaza and these sort of uh, broader, uh, sorry, smaller scale conflict has been um, a tit for tat and sort of, you know, disproportionate, sorry, the opposite of disproportionate, proportionate uh, retaliatory measures in order to kind of like understand where the ledger is at, right, yeah. between the two of them. But this this kind of upends a whole ledger. This means that I think Netanyahu is going to come down so hard on Gaza and Hamas and any sort of... Um, sniff of folks who are supporting Hamas, that um, it's going to be a really horrific um, turmoil for yeah. folks who are involved. So, and, and that's, uh, that's the tragedy in all of this. It's just, it really is. Yeah. it's the cycle of, it's the cycle of violence that uh, when Israel does respond and they will, and they will viciously because yeah. they'll see it as their prerogative to. And, and I don't, I don't, I don't imagine. Um, I mean, we haven't seen, many world leaders come out and support Hamas and the other Palestinian terror groups that are involved in this attack. Yeah, I think that's right. Israel will be given carte blanche to respond how it sees fit. Mm -hmm. um, and that will confirm what Palestinians in Gaza already suspect, which mm -hmm. is that their only hope to achieve liberation as they see it is mm -hmm. through violence. Yeah. And so that's we right. go. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the, it, sorry. sorry, go ahead, Ethan. Well, the last piece that I, that I think is important to mention here is, um, you know, we've talked about the Israeli domestic political situation. There is politics happening between uh, organizations in the Palestinian territories as well. I mean, this is as much Hamas speaking to the Palestinian people. Yeah, to Fatah as well, of course. Saying to Fatah, you're 
your model of resistance has failed. Mm-hmm. Saying mm-hmm. to the Palestinian people, our model is working. We can yeah. strike at the heart of the quote unquote Zionist regime uh, yeah. and, and strike fear into them. Um, I mean, are they right? Is Hamas ascended I mean, now? <laughs> Hamas has been sort of trying to agitate for years and years, right? And I think yeah. part of the reason why Fatah has not held elections uh, or had been reticent to hold elections in the West Bank is because they know that they might lose. Right. I think Hamas has been seen as the only ones who are still supporting and pushing for the Palestinian cause, whereas Fatah has really just atrophied over the years. Um, And so, yes, I absolutely agree with you there, Ethan. I just think, I mean, overall, this is such a pyrrhic victory, right? This is something that I remember, like, looking back at the 67 and 73 wars in Israel and thinking all pyrrhic victories because nobody really wins out. It's just very tragic. Um, But I really think that maybe Hamas is... uh, overplay the hand here um, mm. and you know we'll, we shall see what happens in the next couple of days yeah um but uh, if the goal if the goal the is, is yeah. right if the goal is or ever was um the creation of an independent palestinian state uh, I, I can't speak for the for the hamas leadership i don't know exactly what their goals are if yeah. that was the goal this will be a tremendous failure this will set back Absolutely. peace negotiations for a generation, like you said. Yeah. So, yeah. Tragedy all I mean, around. Tragedy all around, Ethan. What, what is the uh, the major sort of uh, the the kind of U.S. and other major players been been saying? I haven't been. Yeah. Tuning I mean, in. Biden and Netanyahu spoke on the phone this morning. Um, uh-huh. Blinken tweeted words of support. Von der Leyen in in Europe tweeted words of support for Israel. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I I think I think this will be seen. Um, I hesitate to say this, but but the truth is that um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is in so many ways mm-hmm. a public relations conflict, mm-hmm. at least as it pertains to support in the wider world. I think the scenes of slit throats um, mm-hmm. and Palestinian and, and, and Israeli civilians and commanders and soldiers, we haven't mentioned this, taking hostage. Oh, yeah. Into taken Gaza. from tanks and yeah, military taken, vehicles. There are elderly was, yeah. women being yeah. paraded through the streets in Gaza. I think those images will linger for a very long time, oh, at yeah. least in the Western world. Yeah, this is a, um, yeah, a whole generation. I mean, you know, I think what I was reflecting on this recently, actually, because Golda, the movie about Golda Meir, has right. just come out with Helen Mirren starring as as her. Um, and it looked at sort of the failings of the 73 war and how... Israel was unable to respond or didn't respond to the Yom Kippur morning um, yeah. attacks, right, from across the Sinai. And I think about uh, a lot of my friends from Tel Aviv who were sort of watched that movie and made commentary about it, saying, oh, what a, what a cluster that was, you know, that time of um, Israeli history. And you look at where we are now, and it's in many ways the sort of facts are analogous, right, in that yeah. there's internal turmoil within Israel, right, and there's like regional shifts, um, and discontent elsewhere, and then uh, sort of unification um, with the adversaries, right, within yeah. the adversaries of Israel. So um, I don't know. I'd be very curious, you know, to see where we go from here in regards to how other Middle Eastern states respond to this, right? Yeah. How is the UAE going to broker some kind of a ceasefire, for example, right? I think the UAE had urged restraint from both sides, same with Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, the regional players are going to be much more present in this conflict than they were in previous ones. Um, so that is something that I think would be really interesting to watch. Absolutely. And, I mean, to give a scale, to give a sense of, of the scale of how people are thinking about this in Israel, I mean, we've heard reports that they're calling it, comparing it to, to 9-11. Um, yeah, that's yeah, how yeah, significant. Absolutely. That's how traumatic this event will be. And again, we're seven hours. Or in, a Pearl so, Harbor, right? Or yeah, you know, choose choose your metaphor. I mean, yeah. Um, so I think we better both get back to watching cable news. But Helen, thanks so much for your time. Um, yeah, I'm sure we'll speak about this again. Thank you, Ethan.